So the Saudi-led intervention in the Yemen war starts eight years ago today. And eight years ago today, the first reports from Oxfam, sorry, from Amnesty International, highlight the first civilian uh, deaths. Um, 26th of March 2015, if you can look on the Amnesty International website and you'll find reports saying 14 civilian homes destroyed, six children under the age of 10 killed, and Amnesty saying these are potential war crimes and they need to be investigated. A few days later, another report from Amnesty International um, highlighting similar atrocities. So from day one of the war, We've been aware in the West, and it's been reported in the West, the atrocities that have been committed um, by the Saudi-led coalition. Eight years ago tomorrow, the British, on the 20, 27th of March 2015, the British press quotes the Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond talking about Britain's role in the war in Yemen. And Philip Hammond, the Foreign Secretary, says... We have this major infrastructure supporting the British-built jets that the Saudis will be flying over Yemen. The Saudis will be flying our jets over Yemen. We, we supply an infrastructure that supports the operation of those jets, and we will continue to supply that. Logistical support, technical support, maintenance, ammunition, spare parts, etc., etc., etc. He goes on to say, the Foreign Secretary, we will do everything short of engaging in combat to support the Saudis. Eight years ago tomorrow. Eight years of atrocities, an estimated 360 odd thousand people killed. Um, not all of them through violence, many through the blockade imposed by the Saudis and the UAE, which has caused world, uh, one of the worst outbreaks of cholera in recorded history. Um, according to Save the Children, uh, was it 2018? At that point, three years into the war, 85,000 infant children had died, have died of starvation or preventable disease in a man-made humanitarian catastrophe caused by our allies with our help. That blockade is enforced by the Saudi military, UAE military, which has been supplied by the British. Most of the violent killings in the war caused by airstrikes, i.e. airstrikes by British and American jets, dropping British and American supplied bombs, flown by British and American trained pilots, pilots, and with British and American crews on the ground maintaining those jets. So the first key point, I want to make three key points, and the first one is that yes, this is Saudi and Emirati violence, but it's also our violence, it's secondarily British violence, British and American violence. It's important to stretch, to remember, and to stress when you have conversations with people about this, when you do your campaigning, that those jets don't fly without ongoing British and American support. Without the logistical support, the technical support, the maintenance, the ammunition, those jets don't fly. They would be grounded within a fortnight if that support was cut off. So the, the role that the British and Americans play is a really important enabling role that you can describe, I would say, as, as acting as accessories to mass murder and to war crimes. People will then say to you, well, if we didn't supply it, then the Russians and the Chinese would supply weapons, which is, you know, as though if we didn't act as accessories to mass murder and someone else did, would, so why don't we do it? and at least we'll make some money out of it. This horrible logic that people will reflexively go to. Not only is it morally, it's kind of morally degenerate to provide that kind of logic, it's not even accurate, in, you know. These weapon systems can't be replaced at the drop of a hat. You can't simply replace a fleet of British and American jets with a fleet of Chinese and Russian jets and the pilots trained to use them, etc., etc at the drop of a hat. It will take years to replace what the British and Americans have provided. So it's worth remembering that as well, because it gives, gives you an extent, a sense of the extent of British and American complicity. The second thing to remember about this is that violence against civilians, let's not, let's not look at Yemen in isolation, violence against civilians is a normal, standard part of British foreign relations. Throughout the years of empire, throughout the years of post-colonial violence, right up to the present day, 
violence against civilians has been inherent to British power. We sit here, we stand here in the centre of British power. This whole, you know, the architecture of this district was built to intimidate foreign dignitaries when they came here and to, and to display the, the, you know, the extent of British power. All of that was built on violence. The in, inherent to empire was violence. Terrorising civilians, coercing civilians, intimidating civilians, enforcing British power with violence. That includes, more specifically, aerial bombing of civilians. The aerial bombing of civilians was a tactic pioneered by the RAF in Iraq in the 1920s. Last time I did a vigil with Cap, it was outside the, um, the High Court. A hundred yards from the High Court, there's a statue of a guy called Arthur Harris. Arthur Harris was a squadron leader of the RAF in Iraq in the 1920s, who pioneered this technique of bombing civilians to intimidate and terrorise them, raising villages to the ground. And he said that he talked about it quite openly. The aim is to terrorise the population. Arthur Harris then went on to be the chief of bomber command in World War II during the firebombing of, um, of Dresden and Hamburg. Aerial bombing to terrorise civilians was employed as a military tactic in Amman and Yemen in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s in British counterinsurgency campaigns waged to ensure that when Yemen and Amman became independent they would stay within the British sphere and not move off in an independent direction. And now we have aerial, aerial bombing of civilians done for the same reason but done by our allies rather than by ourselves but fundamentally it's the same role that violence against civilians is playing in British foreign relations. The third and final thing to remember, I think, is this, that the war seems to be winding down, but we can't drop the subject of Yemen. Even when the war is over, whether as a frozen conflict or whatever else in the, in the coming years, we can't drop the subject of Yemen, because it's Yemen is about Yemen and it's about other things too. It's about the nature of British power in the world. It's a teachable moment. It's a lesson. It's a historical lesson. And it's one that we have to keep telling. We're going into a moment now, let me just finish on this, we're going into a moment now, a historical moment of superpower conflict, conflict between the West on the one hand, Russia and China on the other, it's going to be a period of increased militarism, more conflict, more arms sales, and the story will be told that we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, and anyone who disagrees with us and challenges us is a traitor and in the league with our enemies. We have to resist that. We have to maintain dissent and the example of Yemen is one that has to be used as a teachable moment when we maintain that dissent. It's one that shows us the true nature of Western power in the world and, one, and it's a face of Western power that we have to keep showing to the general public as we go forward. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.